It's a, it's a great pleasure for me to be the moderator today, um, especially because the, uh, the depth of experience we have with the, uh, the two panellists today. Um, all locals will have met uh, and know Chris Fearless really well. Chris is the director at uh, Cobran Coal Storage. He's got a really depth of experience, especially with working with, uh, with retailers and has an understanding of their, their needs in terms of quality uh, and also food safety. Um, also, um, the other panellist is Harvey, Harvey Giblet, um, I think very well known to anyone who's been in this industry. Uh, Harvey was awarded the APAL uh, Lifetime Achievement Award um, at our last, um, at our last uh, conference. Um, and has a depth of experience that I think is unmatched in this room in terms of understanding apples and quality. Um, Harvey uh, owns and operates Newton Brothers, no, sorry, Newton Orchards in Manjimup, sorry, excuse me, um, and uh, which is a very large scale uh, operation in, uh, in WA. So this is an open forum, so it's, uh, it's absolutely around questions. Um, so if you've got a question that relates to quality, we're, um, it's an open opportunity to, uh, to put it to the panel. Um, I'll start the, uh, the conversation with a question to set the scene to, to Chris. There's a lot of talk about quality and it's, a, it's a, a theme that comes up at every conference and every meeting about what we're doing. Are you able to give us a, a, your view on what the current state of, of quality and how it's, how it's progressed over the last few years, uh, in particular in those, in those major retailers? I, I probably have a differing view to, to, the, to, to a lot of people within industry and my, my view on, on quality is, is firstly that we don't recognise that there is inconsistency. As, as packers, we generally, we generally have a, a view that, that we need to have a packable yield of some, some substance and, and, and that drives inconsistency in my view and, and we see that largely every day within the retail sector of, of, our, of, of fresh produce around around the nation. Um, I'm, I'm not convinced that we're getting any better at what we do as, as fruit packers and, and marketers and, and, and I'm certainly not sure that we communicate what we do and how we do it on a, on a regular basis. So I don't think we've actually made too much ground in regard to, to quality and consistency. We have a, a significant focus on, on, on certainly packable yield but that's not driving what I think is a consistent standard within, within our uh, wholesale or retail uh, footprints within this country. And how much do you think that comes down to, can be driven by understanding the maturity standards? We heard from Nadia on, on the importance of maturity in terms of eating quality and, and repeat purchase. How much of that do you think comes to, to maturity and how much does that come to other factors like defects, colour? Uh, there's, there's, two, there's two issues in, in your question and, and maturity has certainly a, a significant place in, in, in the consistency offer um, and pink ladies we've talked about a, a, a little this morning already and, and pink ladies are a standout where we have one, two and three picks and, and the Golden Valley that, we, that I can speak of tends to be a late harvest area or we choose to make it a late harvest area and, and, and we then choose to market that product throughout the year. And, and that in itself drives some significant inconsistencies in store where we've got mixes of products of, of late harvest and early harvest and, and um, lentil spotting and, and yellow background and, and all sorts of different functions. But equally, we have other issues throughout the year and, and people like myself are even responsible for where, where in our case we're a commercial cold store operator and, and we still get it wrong. So, so, so there's a distressed segment of, of our industry that, that we manage through retailers and wholesalers as well and, and, and that drives inconsistency, Andrew. So where we've got a, a poor, poor outcome from, from storage being short, medium or long, then, then we drive an inconsistency, in, inconsistency in that space. We have other segments of our, of our industry that we don't do well, and, and that's about how we, the, the, the change over periods from, from conventional stored apples and pears to, to CA, and, and how we limit 
or we choose to limit how we manage that product, often, often market values determine storage openings or, or cool store openings where there's, a, in my view, there's not enough planning in how we manage cool stored stock and, and, and strategies around that. And there are some really good examples on, on some people doing that really well. And we'll probably talk about that a little later uh, in the day, but, but largely cool store openings can be very much driven by market conditions rather than fruit qualities. And, and that drives another inconsistency in our, in our market floor as well. And then the retailers are driving that with, a, with an understanding of the of those rooms and understanding of the of the changeovers, or are they doing this blind? Not, not in my view. I, I think there's vendors that are, are working working cooperatively with retailers to to have them understand more of what their storage and 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 volume footprints look like, but. But in my view, we still have a, a concrete warranty. Once it's off my concrete, I really don't care what happens to it after that. And, and I think that, that largely is, is driven by probably the second tier to packer. I'm not sure it's necessarily driven by the vendor. But, the, but, but there's tiers of packers under vendors that probably don't have the same responsibilities to fruit quality that vendors do. And, and then there's an, a disengagement between vendors, packers and retailers and, and in my view that needs to be shortened right up. I, I think there's too... And Nadia, Nadia had a good slide up there. You know, there's, there's too many dark passages in our supply chain yep. and I think we need to, to try and tidy that up. But we hear from the retailers, um, one in particular, that they look to, to tidy up that second tier. So they've got, they've got a consolidated vendor number list but it's that second tier of suppliers to those vendors uh, where they have problems and they've put in processes like re um, requirements like um, internal defect sorters and things to an attempt to, to get some control over that second tier. Do you, en do you, do you envisage that to continue, that the, the retailers will continue to put pressure on that, on that second tier, that oh, indirect supplier? Oh, I, I actually have a, a, a different view. I don't think it, needs, it should be up to the, to the retailer to actually be driving and policing that. That that um, that engagement. I think it actually needs to be reversed. It needs to come back from. It needs to come from industry going forward. And my relationship with vendors over a long period of time has been very open and transparent. And and sometimes that's very challenging, very challenging. And but but in my view, there's there's a, a transparency piece that that industry largely doesn't do well. And and vendors are. Um, Retailers, beg your pardon. I think are very hungry for for greater communication and transparency, but I don't think that that, that the retailer should be should should have to demand uh, or, or, or push that. I think it needs to come from industry forward. Yeah, this is something we agree on that uh, that there should be an industry led. If if, if we if we as an industry are not going to the retailers, the retailers will come to us with their with their solutions, and their solutions might not be uh, in our best interest. There's. There's a lot of work being done in the past on regionality and um, varietal strains and, and best practice type functions to, to drive consistency, but we still, we're still a long way from having that, that done properly. And, and in fact, I, I think you know, we've, we've really only just started that conversation because we, we largely talk about what we're going to do and we we tend to over-promise and under-deliver in that space, and, that, and in my view, that's a consistent problem. So, Nadia talked to, to Pom and West as an industry um, trying to solve a problem around maturity, so early, um, early galas or late pinks. Um, which, as an example of where the industry is taking a lead in terms of quality and, and going to the retailer with a solution. Um, a, a question for Harvey. The, the, the practices around maturity testing, the sort of the technical elements of doing that. How, how do we turn something that is an industry thing and bring that to a, to a grower to get more consistency at the grower level where they are doing this themselves, they are understanding what maturity is and understanding um, the correct time to harvest depending on, the, on their storage. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, <coughs> I, b I believe it's uh, 
it's a whole industry approach we need to be taking. As we know, um, most things get um, lobbed back on, on the farm orchardist at the farm gate. Um, if it's a quality issue, it's his fault, um, it's his responsibility, and probably to a large degree it is, but I, I believe in terms of um, getting um, consistent maturity, it, it's a whole of industry approach. It's not uh, the retailer talk, uh, driving it, it like um, Chris said, you know, coming back and telling us what we should be doing. We should be doing it uh, collectively and um, encouraging and communicating right through the um, supply chain from growing right through to retail. I think one of the observations that um, we made last night at dinner was um, we haven't had any um, post-harvest researchers um, in Australia pretty much since we had Colin Little and um, Stan Hardesty in Western Australia. There's been no real post-harvest experts around like those guys since th they, they were doing it. So there's been a bit of a void, I think, even though we've got great technology and um, cool storage and controlled atmosphere, um, I think we, we tend to um, think we know it, um, but I think something like an apple that's dying from the day that you harvest it, um, we slow it up with technology, but we don't stop it. I think we need to be constantly working at how we keep that apple alive and in the best possible condition uh, to when we get it to the point of um, the consumer buying it. That's a pretty tough, tough ask. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's so um, highly perishable in lots of ways and lots of ways not, but if we don't get that right, um, it can give a different experience every, every time and every year is a little bit different. So I, I think we need to be talking a, about a quality uh, as, as an industry and we need to be talking to all, all, chain, all parts of the chain in the industry of how, how we um, get that best result uh, for our consumers. That, that industry control that, that Palm West is looking to, or has brought in last season for, um, for Apple maturities, how far do you think that can go? Can it, can it go to, to naming and shaming, to, to outing these people directly and, and, and openly, or is it... Uh, how far, how, far can, how far can it go in a, in a self-regulation sense, do you think? Uh, we've definitely talked about that, the name and shame, and um, it's, it's something that really I think is a last resort. No, no one really likes, not one grower doesn't like to point the finger at another grower, but it's, it, it, it is an option, um, but I'd rather encourage, um, have a common goal um, to for all of us to strive to achieve rather than um, pointing the finger at when something, someone does something wrong. I think we can, uh, we can certainly notify them that it's a fail or whatever. And one thing we probably saw on one of these uh, slides that Nadia had up there is uh, the certificate of um, if you get a clean season with no fails, um, present the grower with a certificate. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. You know, um, reward effort with um, success rather than um, you know treat people with a big stick if you get it wrong. Yes. Um, so I think it's all about working together, having a common goal, making sure everyone's uh, informed and participating in what we're trying to achieve. Could I make some comments too in that space? Um, w one thing that, that I'm actually a believer of is that, that largely I'm not sure that, that people, packers, believe that they are doing a poor job in some sense because there's, there's no visibility or there's a lack of visibility between, between the dispatch point of, of product from, from a packing shed to, to a retail position. And I do a lot of store visits because that's what I do. But, but largely, I'm not sure that many people do that, Andrew. And so you think you could be doing a good job, but you actually could be doing a, 
a poor job in some capacity, but you actually don't know it. And I'm not sure there's a, other than, other than a rejection at, at a distribution centre or a receival centre, there's not enough visibility to, to us as industry because we're not following that, that pathway of product through to the end, to the end consumer. So what, I think there's a big gap in that space as well. I'm just following in on what Poem West are doing. How do you report a poor performance back to any particular packer if they don't know about it and, and there's no pathway to do that? You, we, there's, there's certainly greater visibility now with, with new PLU design and, and traceability functions that, that retailers have largely brought in. But I think there's still an, an enormous disengagement between what people see in store and how that's actually communicated back through a vendor or actually to the packer. Uh, yeah, so that's, to me, there's two parts to that. There's the, the merchandise part, so that's the store, uh, the information coming back from the store to the grower and how it actually turned out, not how it got to the DC, but how it got to the, the consumer. And the, and the maturity of the industry part, which is what Palm West has been doing, where they're actually giving the feedback on what they're seeing post -harp, well, after the harvest has taken place, what the maturities were. I'd like to get your views, Harvey. The, to me, the real success in a program like what's happened in, uh, out west is it happens in that second year. So those growers who have harvested with incorrect maturities and have, would be disappointing their customers, the real benefit comes this year because th this year's fruit's still on the tree. They can make the right decisions. They can do the testing themselves or they can ask you to help them with their testing. To me, the real benefit comes in this season from last season's hard work. Do you think the growers who have had fails for maturity will be receptive and, and, and that's true or is that uh, wishful thinking? Um, Andrew, I, I think it's just something that we've just got to keep on doing. You know, um, we spoke about the big stick and we don't want to use that. We just um, want to win, win the argument by um, consistently selling the right message, um, being consistent in what we do and how we approach it. And, and obviously you can't do the this um, without resources and we're fortunate in Western Australia that we have the APC Act that we're able to raise a fee for service um, for our industry and we're able to fund um, someone to look after and monitor and drive that program which is the only way it can happen. You know, yes. you can send out all the literature, all the text messages and under the world and they last for five minutes and then it's gone. Yeah. This, this program of ours is um, it's ongoing, you know, we just got to keep at it. You can't take your foot off the pedal. You, if you, as soon as we say, oh, well, fantastic, we had no fails this year, we're not going to do it anymore, guess what? It'll just slip back into mediocrity again. So I see it as pretty much an ongoing program with variations about um, technology and and all sorts of um, innovations that will come in the future, but it's something that we need to be passionate about and we need to put resources into it continually to make it happen, otherwise it just won't happen. Uh, where are we to time? Um, we're still open for any questions if you want to butt in, that's, uh, that's fine by me. Um, Chris, you and I have talked in the past about what the, the retailers are thinking of, and they've talked for at least two years now, about bringing in controls around the way they supply based on regions and by, by, uh, by strain, with regions being a, a proxy for maturity and, and strain being a proxy for colour. Do you think this is going to land? Do you think this is going to be a, 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 an important uh, implication for our industry if the, if the retailers start enforcing some of these, um, these supply requirements? I, I, I believe it is, but, but equally, I'm not sure that that it's the role of retailers. Again, I think the industry need to be more responsible for, for what we do and how we do it. Pink, Pink Lady is another good example where there's lots of different strains and, and lots of different growing regions and we, we have inconsistencies across, across that pl platform every day. Um, so at some point, with the help of retailers, vendors and, and growers, grower packers need to have a good understanding of what that footprint is and, 
and what's going to be offered on a daily, weekly, well, on a weekly basis, so we get some consistency across that platform. Um, and I don't like to do this, but Red Delicious is a good example. Retailers largely are, are receiving every strain, every colour, every shape of Red Delicious known to man. And, and when Red Delicious are gone, and, and, and people will say, well, it's, it's a done variety anyway, but I'd argue that that, 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 Red Delicious, that Red Delicious will be Fuji, and Fuji will be Golden Delicious, and Golden Delicious will be something else, and before you know it, Pink Lady will be threatened by a new variety. If, we, if we're not careful, on how we manage our varieties, we'll, we'll have a depletion forced upon us by ourselves. So we need to have some, some responsibilities and some process and function on how we actually manage that, that region, regionality and, 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 and consistency and quality and strain. Otherwise, it'll, it'll we'll, we'll develop our, our own declining footprint in, in, in more further in quality and, and variety. And we've seen some success in pairs in this space and where the, re where the industry is, is dictating or talking to the retailers about what's the best way to, uh, to manage their supply. Um, obviously, we've got these big changeovers, Williams to Packham's, Packham's to Williams. With the industry taking the lead and saying, this is what's best, this is where the maturities are, you know, Fruit Growers Victoria say, the Williams are going to be ready, the Packham's are going to be ready on this day. This is the way we should manage our, our season, and this is the way uh, we recommend the retailers have a nice smooth transition from, from Williams to Packham's, for example. Is there scope for the industry to do more of that um, and, and to be more coordinated in terms of when, when areas start, uh, what strains are done where, and, and, and at what level that, uh, would, would you imagine that control coming in? In my view, there is. And, and I believe that retailers have a space in, in, in helping that happen as well. I, I'm not convinced that there's, there's enough group engagement between retailers and vendors. I'd like to see greater involvement in a group sense with, with, a, with a retailer and, and their main body of, of, um, of vendors. So there's open discussion about these sorts of activities and start dates and so on. Equally, this time of the year is very challenging and, and I've been guilty of this in, the, in, in past lives where I want to be first to market for the people that employ me and, and, and broadly you don't do the right job. So at the moment we'll be scouting around looking at headland blocks and all sorts of different things to get the march on Williams and the march on Gala but is that the right thing to do to be this week against next week? Largely it's not and it never has been. So there's got to be greater in, in involvement and greater responsibility and transparency in that part as well. Retailers, retailers are very trusting people and, and I believe with, that we need to engage in a, in a more transparent and honest approach on how we do that for the better of quality and, and consistency and repeat purchase. So Harvey, so the, with the WA industry is shaped the way it is, it gives you an opportunity to have more control because you, you can work in a, in a smaller environment in terms of uh, numbers of suppliers and, and, and outlets. Is there an opportunity to move further with, um, with the sort of uh, South Rig Glacier control and move away from just maturity and into things like strain, colour uh, and, and, and that sort of thing to, to actually extend your sort of self-regulation? Um, it's, I, I think we're, we're an isolated um, as I said, because we're, we're financially uh, um, able to do what we do in Western Australia on a wider industry basis that somewhere some resources have got to go to do back up whatever you um, want, to, want to implement. Um, so, yeah, it, but that's not to say that um, if we've all got the will to do it, it can happen. And I think um, uh, APAL is obviously the vehicle to drive that and um, on, the, on the Australian basis. The other thing I just want to say is that um, Future Orchard's been an amazing um, program in terms of lifting production in, yes. in Australia. And most growers that have taken on board um, the Future Orchards 
program uh, have benefited from that. But it's interesting because um, a lot of it was driven by um, New Zealand consultants coming across here and advising us on that, which was, was great. But it's interesting now that they're, they're taking a slightly different tack. They're taking a, a quality approach to what they're doing. It's just not about volume and quantity. It's very much about quality. And I, I think there's a good message there for us as well. You know, um, it's okay to produce 80 or 100 tonnes to the hectare or whatever the, the number is for you. But it's much more important to have a um, 75 or 85 per cent pack out of what you produce. Um, that gives you a much, if you're achieving those sort of pack outs, you, invariably you've got very high quality fruit. Um, so I, th I think there's more, ga there's more gains to be had by making sure we improve quality in what we're doing as, as growers than actually growing more, more tonnage per hectare. The quickest way to increase um, profit in a, in a grower's pocket is to increase his pack out. If you increase your pack out by 5 or 10%, it goes straight to your pocket because um, all your other uh, costs are taken out. So it's the one area that we can increase our profitability the quickest. Um, it's not the easiest, but it's the quickest way of um, increasing profitability back to the grower is to increase your pack out. However you um, manage your orchard and um, maturities and stuff to achieve that, that's, that's the crux of um, getting a better pack out. And that's where I think we should be driving is to make sure that we're maximising our pack outs to increase profitability. It's the quickest way to in increase profitability back to the grower. I'll make sure you talk to Rose when you uh, make your plan, when she makes her plans for the next uh, uh, few orchards. Uh, any questions? Thank you. Uh, Richard from the Bud Group. A question for you, Harvey, if I may, uh, just regarding in-field sampling. So obviously we've got technical parameters set uh, for what we're looking to achieve for fruit maturity. Uh, and if I think to the wine industry example, the winery is a very specific around sampling guidelines for statistical rigour. So they'll dictate some wineries more than others, but they'll dictate which row, which vine, which bunch, whether it's berry sampling, bunch sampling, vine sampling, to meet their statistical standards. Um, and there's some pretty exciting technology coming down the track for non-destructive fruit maturity sampling. But what can we do this year and the next few years until that technology catches up for best in-field fruit sampling so that we get a representative, uh, say, of an apple, an apple block? Um, it's also interesting, to talk, I was sitting next to Rowan Little last night and he was saying probably the best bit of innovation that APAL or anyone in the industry could do was to bring on robotic field testing, uh, maturity testing, and I think that's a fantastic concept and probably the um, area that we need to head to um, sooner rather than later, especially when that technology becomes more efficient and, and more readily available. As, it, as it, of now, of course, it's, it, it's destructive testing. You go out and take a, a, a random sample of a block and, it, and it's destructive testing. And of course, a lot of people don't like to destroy fruit. Um, so that's, that, that is a, a minor issue in my view because it's more important to make sure you get the, uh, what you're about to harvest at the right maturities. And we have, as Nadia said, we're off offering that service to our growers to come out and do free testing and also to show them how, how to test and how to select fruit from, from blocks to do the testing. Could I again make some comments? And, and in, in relation to the, 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 the question from the floor, commercially, we can be doing more in that space as well. Largely, commercial cool store operators receive stock, in this region at least, receive stock that goes into cool store for a period of time. We, we really never know what that period of time is because it's largely driven by 
other circumstances where other fruit might be stored or market conditions and, and the like. And, and historically, there's never really been a, a um, performance criteria set, a, a, a process of understanding what that fruit is going into cool store. And, and that in itself brings in difficulties later on in the year. So there's a lot more work being done in this region now of, of what those fruit parameters are be, be, as they're going into cool store. And people like ourselves are actually trying to, to determine when that fruit should be coming back out of cool store rather than waiting for a market condition change before that fruit comes out of store. And, and, and I believe that will, will provide certainly less risk and less claim activity and, and less reputational damage but greater consistency back into the, into the supply chain as well. So there's, there's a couple of pieces into your question, but I think we're improving by, we're, it's been forced upon us in some respects, but we're getting better at how we manage that type of product off, off field and into cool store. Yes. Um, Dr. Jenny Hi. back there, I think. Uh, Jenny Ekman, post harvest researcher. Um, this is a bit left field, but I mean, you're mostly talking about quality issues to do with under mature fruit, from what I understand. But over maturity and bruising and other things can also be a problem for consumers. So the question is how much of that is down to the last 10 metres before the checkout? And is there a role for better training of, of retailers and any consumers of how they should be handling and storing apples? On, please. I, I think there is, but but equally, don't push the problem onto retailers yeah. for them to try and fix it. Yeah. And 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 retailers will openly say their ability to to merchandise or the, the last five metres is very difficult. And we openly openly and of, often say, how does this product get into into store? But but largely we're doing it, and and either we're doing it. In, in openness or we're doing it deceitfully, but it's happening. So I think that we need to not, not push the product on to retailers and have them try and fix it for us. There's got to be more work done behind the retailer to make sure that we're doing a, a better and better job and, and, and have a transparent engagement with retailers on what's coming. I can see the morning tea is out there. So we'll, we'll have... Uh, a, one last question. We'll have, thank you, uh, Justin. One last question. Nadia. Uh, this is actually a question, it's a bit of a statement. We were talking a couple of questions, um, you know, about what we can do right now. Um, we do have this maturity testing guide and we're, we've sent it out to all the state representatives. All our growers have a copy of this um, and we're quite um, open to sharing it with the industry if, we, if, if required. So I invite anyone who wants to have a quick look. I've got a couple of copies on my table and, um, yeah, definitely we, we would... Be, um, we're all working together. This is a, an industry where we we we're not unite. We we should unite. I think in this quest. So that's what all, all I had to say. Thank you. Thanks, Nadia. Um, appreciate you sharing your, uh, your WA stuff with the wider industry. Um, I think that wraps up the uh, our panel, and I'd like to take this chance to um, thank our panelists for their time and their thoughts today. Thanks, uh, Nadia. Thanks, Chris. Thanks very much. Thanks, Dan. Thanks.